And that takes us to the number four and final album that we're going to be covering. I think Sam is going to have our first take on that one. But uh, Josh, would you like to give us a little bit of a, of a rundown here? Television Personalities is the band. Uh, the name of the album, uh, another tongue twister in terms of uh, titles. Go ahead and give me give me the title. Oh, oh yeah. And the title is... Um, and don't it's got a uh, ellipses. ellipses yeah that's right uh, and don't the kids just love it and don't the kids just love it. and this one's from all the way back in 1981 guys so this one goes back a while um the the intro on all music here says over the course of a long career that led them from wide-eyed shambling pop to the outer reaches of psychedelia and back britain's <laughs> television personalities influenced artists as diverse as feedback virtuosos the jesus and mary chain twee pop titans the pastels lo-fi kingpins pavement and neo psych oddballs mgmt so hmm. if you want to know bands that cite them as an influence <laughs> there are four and they are very different bands all four of those for sure um the i guess the the origin story or it, it, origin story here i should say is uh don tracy is every every band always seems to start with one person right then it expands yep. off from there so in this case it's don tracy and he is the songwriter um he was i'll guess i'll give you one hint in 1970s or one guess i should say in 1977 uh what he was inspired to start music uh in you want to take a guess as to what caused him to want to to start recording music and be in a band uh, in 1977 either, i would say the sex pistols maybe or yes a, the nascent <laughs> punk movement which yes. that usually means the sex pistols the clash the ramones right <laughs> the dam some combination of all of those bands right and different things so tracy is is no different than that he's british i feel like you really can't have started a band anytime from the late 70s to the early 80s without being influenced yeah. by punk at that time and then branching off um in terms of a through line, Josh, to continue what we've been talking about, the BBC's John Peel became a vocal supporter of the group. Mm, and yes. uh, they moved from uh, the name O-Level to Television Personalities. Uh, and they release uh, their first EP called Where's Bill Grundy Now? Um, and it has a hit on it called Part-Time Punks. So then I I've seen – I looked at a couple different resources ahead of this. Television personalities is kind of one of these groups that's not a fully defined group of who's in it. It's kind of like, right, like Dan Tracy and then whoever wants to be in the group with him or whoever's oh, in the group it. with him at the time, right? Okay. I guess similar to like a Nine Inch Nails, Trent Reznor, or recently like a Billy Cork at Smashing Pumpkins. It's like them and like whoever's around them at the time. So, mm -hmm. um, but the first lineup had organist vocalist Ed Ball guitarist joe foster and that is the group that records and don't the kids just love it um and it actually does have some commercial success um in england and they actually end up forming uh tracy and ed ball who was just mentioned they're the vocalist and organist end up forming their own label wham w-h-a-a-m but unfortunately uh they had to name that <laughs> later because as you might imagine wham the pop groups uh attorneys threaten them and they end up yeah. changing the label after that and really that kind of is the beginning it's much like a lot of those punk punk bands right they kind of come together there's pieces and then they they uh sort of record and in their case it was sort of like four years worth of recording these loose pieces um, that lead them there. Sometimes the, the turnaround right of that story is massively quick. Like we saw uh, Josh with like wire in the clash that took almost no time to get a record label. Mm -hmm. Some, it takes like a couple years of gigging and then they're there. This seems to be a little bit longer one where they're kicking around for four years uh, doing different stuff and playing a little bit under different names with nothing. And then it leads to this. Um, Throughout the 80s, they continue to be sort of a genre-shifting band, but they're often described with two terms, the experimental and sort of the psychedelic would be the things hmm. that come up quite a bit, which the second one definitely was interesting to me, but I'll talk about that later. Yeah. Um, I think Sam will get the first take, and I'll get the second. Josh will get the third. Uh, thoughts on this album, Sam? Sure. I 
to me, this was the surprise album, right? Like, I knew what I was getting with Chili Peppers. Heard that album, maybe not, like, continuously in the past, like, on and on and on. But I've heard the album in full in the past. You know, Mel and Camp, I kind of knew, I knew what I was getting in terms of just music. Right. This was, this and the Dead Can Dance were completely new to my ears. I enjoyed this one. Like this one, it kind of in some ways, you, you know, you guys brought up the the punk bands, but I heard more Elvis Costello and the Kinks in there, along with elements of the Clash, in terms of just the 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 musical stylings, uh, not so much like the chord progressions or anything, but just like the ways in which the 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 sound kind of came across and the ways in which the 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 singing and the lyrics kind of told these uh you know humorous stories like the kinks um and ray davies so like to me this was a, a really neat surprise to kind of like get into and go like oh okay and then kind of situate it contextually with the time of like 81 i was trying to like go back into you know, think through your your earlier podcast of like the 81 of 81s and and before that to go like okay you got like this punk post-punk uh early new wave kind of you know building and and they're all like they're right there in that scene especially if if they're from the london right like so you have that that really interesting mix of sound coming into london uh as kind of like you know that that 60 the british invasion sound kind of like fades out hard um i thought this was a really neat album there are a few songs that i just um wasn't really maybe so keen on in terms of just the execution of it but you know pictures of dorian gray um i know where sid barrett lives was really funny mm-hmm. um silly girl i really enjoyed that one the first song itself like that and the second song like there were certain guitar riffs and drums that just kind of like oh hey i recognize this in terms of that that uh emotion that sound that kind of like pulls from that garage rock kind of like really in terms of its production value, just sonically different than the other three albums uh, in terms of its production value and sound quality. Um, so yeah, I, I, on the whole, I, I kind of, I really thought this was a, a pleasant surprise and a gem. Yeah. This, um, boy, this was an interesting one for me. Um, I, so yeah, my first impression like you Sam was that you know obviously there's elements of the kinks and and I would even say the early who like before the albums of yeah. the who we covered right this is like a quick one like my generation era who right even more so than who sold out Tommy certainly they they evolved in their sound right this yeah, goes it feels back very to the... mod in spirit yes it, yeah. that's a great way to put it josh it's like yeah. that mod thing it's very british i mean you've got like the almost like my name is simon i do <laughs> drawings level like english right here yeah. so in that sense all of that kind of draws a line from i feel like there's this line of very british rock right that goes from yeah the who and the kinks and bands like that dave clark five and stuff into some stuff in the 70s and then eventually ends up at brit pop in the 90s which we haven't really covered yet but you know the sort of embracing the Britishness, right? But at times yeah. it's sort of there. Uh, I struggled with this album for two reasons, I think. One mm-hmm. is, I think even in 1981, the musical scene had sort of evolved past this, in my opinion. And this sort of seemed like a relic from another time. It almost could have been on that Artifacts album oh, yeah, that yeah. we covered. Uh-huh. Yeah, like it, it, like Garage Rock inspired stuff, but it felt like um, by the time 1981 rolls around, this almost felt like a tribute act more so than new vibrant music. Um, yep. There are a couple al- uh, couple songs that have uh, um, like psychedelic spirits, right? And they veer directly into it and they jump out in that way. And in that case, it, in that sense, it also sounds like of the late sixties, right? And in kind of the way that the experimental groups like the United States of America, right? Remember that band we covered and, oh. and Scott Walker and some of that were, but I found those albums to be more appealing. And I think the other reason is 
there was a very conscious choice production wise on this album that I think was a extremely poor choice production wise. <laughs> I would describe it as when I was in college, I had a tape recorder that I would use to do interviews. I, at the time, I was a journalism major, and this the sound quality was sort of hissing and muddied depending on how you use it. sometimes it was muddied and sometimes it was hissing and it was often i would often describe it as like like um as if you were like taped something under a bridge right like this whole album had the spirit of that tape record it's like they borrowed my tape recorder and said yeah. we're going to play the entire album into that tape recorder and oh while we're at it let's also do it under a bridge to make it sound <laughs> as muddled as possible yeah. and so that production was I, I think it's pretty clear if you've listened to the podcast for a while. I don't need sterling and shimmering uh, production. And sometimes I'm even skeptical of that type of production. But there is a line, right, where something becomes so muddied and muddled that it takes away from the overall sound for me and kind of doles out what might be some of the brilliance there. And, yeah, I mean, when you're going to record the equivalent of a grunge rock – or, excuse me, a garage rock album in yep. – uh, under a bridge and a tape recorder, uh, there's limits in terms of how long I'm going to, you know, enjoy it. And while there are, I'm curious, some highlights, though, like not to interrupt you on that one, but yeah. when you listen to, you, are you primarily listening? Because I don't know if you've ever really kind of shared with with your audience. How do you look? What is your primary mode, I guess, of listening to the, or consuming the music? I don't know if I have as defined a a, a lead as so, you know, Matt will always tell you right like the first thing I look for is melody right like melody in the structure right and then I kind of judge it off of the idea of is the melody appealing is the melody absent you know and when he he will tell you like when the melody is absent right like he looks to see are there other redeeming things in here that i enjoy right and then if but it's a harder listen right if the melody's not there he's kind of going off of the preferred rubric is melody and when it's not there it's not that he can't enjoy an album that doesn't have it but he has to basically intellectualize it a little bit more um josh in terms of your preferences i don't think it's quite that direct right but you have some definitive ideas of how you listen to an album right like you you tend to not lock in right and listen to it intently you kind of like it to be couched in in a, a versatile way right like how you would listen to it yeah but sam are you asking that or are you asking how we physically listen to physically. like our mode of mode of yeah, like, are you listening to like <laughs> oh the okay car? i was totally misunderstanding it um, so when did I, I listen to this album twice. The first time I listened to this album was in, in my place, um, while sitting on my couch, just sort of consuming it. That just happened to be where I got it that way. So kind of a uncluttered listen. Yeah. On headphones say. or? That first time I was not on headphones. The second time I listened to it on headphones, but unlike many things, I don't know if the headphones listens made it better or worse. It just, it sounded similar in both. Um, it was not one where the headphones made a difference for me positively or negatively on both of the listens. Um, I, and I've been pretty vocal about the fact that I think headphones listening, there's always going to be one version of it. I listen to on headphones. I feel like I have to at least listen to it on headphones once to get certain things sometimes, but I, this one didn't stand out as one where putting the headphones on made a big difference one way or the other. I, I don't know if that helps. Yeah. Yeah. And Sam, did, did I, it... I, I listen like exclusively through headphones for 95% of the time. Are you talking like over the ear headphones? Like, yep, the... like the same ones we're using to record. So okay. that's good quality. Uh, yep. And how did you listen to this one? Because now I'm curious as to... Car. If... So okay. like... <laughs> So one, like mind you, I, I drive a really old 12 year old Ford Focus, okay. but the stereo is still solid. And so, you know, generally when I get to is drive- Is that a humble brag, Sam, right there? <laughs> no, 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 no. A car with uh, 224,000 miles is not a humble brag. You don't have to um, justify you got me beat. Yeah. So, but like for me, like that's you really John Kajuker Mellon camps over there. That's my <laughs> best audio, the car, and to turn it up and to just listen. Yeah. Um, 
and that gives me that space to really just kind of like you know really consume the music in, in almost like a 360 box so are you using right? that like were you driving with your windows down is that why you didn't notice the production on this album no like my car's out anyway just like, like, oh, like that there's okay. a reason why i mentioned it because like you know like after so many years the foam insulation like yeah it, just doesn't like it is not a quiet car it's not like a toyota right where you're just like oh this is a really quiet ride right this is not a quiet ride but so i didn't really kind of get that that the hiss and the pops and you know like the you know like we're we're pressing record on the old tape recorder with a single microphone um i just kind of like dug into the sound the sonic of it all Mm -hmm. gotcha well, that's good. That's two different perspectives on it. So that's that's our best episodes are when everybody's coming at it from different angles, which is one of the reasons yeah. I Plus, love having you. Plus, it on came right list. after the Dead Can Dance. I was like, <laughs> oh my gosh, oh, so, this okay. is like a palate cleanser. <laughs> okay, Got I got gotcha. you. For those that may be listening to it in isolation on YouTube, um, we're ref- this is uh, season three, bonus episode twenty three. So um, there were four albums we covered, one of which was. A very different album in the Dead Can Dance uh, that Sam was to before this, but Josh, we haven't even asked you what's your what's your take on this. See, I everything that you kind of were maybe bothered by or wore you down, I I found this album absolutely charming, and I feel okay. like a lot of the uh, choices they made uh, were were clearly intentional, and I think they were trying to go for kind of a retro a retro album at that point. Oh, I definitely agree. Yep. And, Mm -hmm. and the fact that it sounds like something from the sixties. So like completely, um, I, I was really, you know, especially since we, our journey through the sixties to some, the fact that I could, if I didn't know this band and I didn't know this band and heard this, I would have thought it was from the sixties. That's kind of like how well it was uh, captured that, that period. Um, I didn't mind. I always liked the lo-fi garage rock, um, quality to albums which is kind well, of an in interesting fairness, look back in anger does sound like 2000s indie rock and, <laughs> yes. and also like it's mid 90s <laughs> mid 90s like blur it sounds like a blur song yeah look back in anger like could literally have been written by damon alburn so like there is i shouldn't just niche it to the 60s it does have an element of indie spirit that comes yeah i, I get what you're saying too about the um the fact that in 81 the music had had moved past this and obviously we were listening to a lot of different things but i think out of the context of 80 i mean if i was in 81 and heard this i probably wouldn't be into it because i would have been into all the other stuff that was going on that was that was not intentionally looking back like this but um i I, you know devoid of devoid of having list the fact that i can listen to it anytime um, I, I found it like kind of a welcoming reminder of what I really liked from the 60s that we listened to. And I thought, uh, like Sam said, I really liked kind of the little vignettes and funny stories that they put throughout, like a song like Jeffrey Ingram about this guy who always just kind of gets away with everything or is re- very lucky, um, I thought was completely fun to listen to. I mean, the fact that the album is 37 minutes, uh, you know, it, does favors for it um it's short and sweet and i feel like uh you know a common phrase we say it doesn't overstay its welcome i feel like it's interesting too because i like the lo-fi garage rock sound but i am not (laughs) responding to any of kind of the noise rock in the and the down-tuned guitars and off-tuned guitars that we are um you know, of all these other bands that we've listened to recently, I feel like in in some ways they should both go hand in hand. If you like one, you should like the other. And that's clearly not the case for me. So I've, I found, found that interesting, but anything that is indebted as much to like the kinks as this album clearly is into that early 60s sound is going to have a soft spot for me. Um, also, I found the cover, um, the, any band that can like incorporate pop culture in that way with with the Avengers and and Twiggy on the cover um, is gonna be uh, is gonna get my attention as well. So um, I just kind of like the fact that it's just you know back to like a guitar and and uh, a drums and maybe a bass and like just that stripped down sound again and the fact that it, it almost feels like an album that 
if given enough effort i could could make um you know a lot of the album a lot of the 80s music that we've listened to is so produced and so kind of complicated or or you're um, talking make like from a production standpoint yeah yeah the fact that i could probably like figure out how to play a guitar to make this album and record it <laughs> like i don't know i just kind of i just kind of like that fact that it sounds like high schoolers made it too um or something akin to that on on a production level that um that all worked for me so um i i gave it a thumbs up i thought it was a pleasant surprise another one of those bands where we you picked it out of the ether and and uh it it worked the po- it, it, the post punk wins again i guess is what i should say ultimately um i, I don't even know if this could be classified as post punk cuz this is written in the punk era right so i think yeah. this is still i don't i mean this is around the same time like the jammer are running is this like british revival of yeah you know, it's garage it's like, rock british <laughs> right. garage rock is it almost is like much. i mean and there are groups that are making that you know the jam comes to mind but um and there's still bands doing like slice of life British stuff. Like we covered Madness and mm-hmm. English Beat, right? Like they're more ska and pop, but like they're kind of writing similar types of songs, right? Like the right. slice of life English life songs. Um, but uh, it sounds like Sam, you really like this one too. You give this yeah, a I would up. like mm-hmm. in terms of when I say really like, I really liked it because of just how new it sounded mm-hmm. in comparison to the four albums of just encapsulating myself within, okay, let me really sit down and really listen to these albums. Um, And in truth, I did the Chili Peppers last because that was the the one I was most familiar. It was this and the Dead Can Dance, which were like one and two to just, okay, let me really sink my teeth into them more. This one was just that pleasant surprise. You know, musically, it didn't really move the needle in terms of like, oh man, it's a new sound, right? Like you're, if you situate it in 81, right, like Josh is saying, it's it's not really moving the needle. In some ways, it is almost, I would kind of say, more post-punk rather than punk because, you know, some of the songs, even though they're, like, they're doing Slice of Life stuff, they're almost making fun of it in some ways um, mm-hmm. with just kind of like the sound of, of his voice when he's talking about, what is it, like Gregory, um, what's his nuts? Jeffrey Ingram. Yeah, Jeffrey Ingram. Yeah. And, and it's like, it's almost like he's kind of just having a laugh at that one. But, you know, it is very much almost in some ways like today's bands, uh, musicians, how they're almost very direct, like direct lines uh, to the musicians that influence yep. them. Right. Like there's no like delineation. You can go like, oh, kinks. Yes. And like John said, the early who? Yes. Mods. OK, cool. Like and you can kind of like pull that curtain right. back and go like that's where they're directly coming from and today's musicians kind of have that same like it's a direct line there is no if and or buts about it this i thought was just like okay this was fun this was interesting will i go and listen to the rest of their stuff probably not will i appreciate just like uh, a handful of their songs come time to time in terms of coming back to this first album maybe but I was like, okay, this was a good find. Yep. There, there were a couple standouts for me. I thought Silly Girl and uh, La Grande yep. Illusion were probably my two favorite songs on the album. Um, a Picture of Dorian Gray did make me laugh. Um, <laughs> yes. Because there's yeah. some absurdist lyrics. I think there's one thing about like a million midget <laughs> Russian submarines or something like that. <laughs> yes. And it's like, we'll eat cucumber sandwich. Like, Cucumber, it was like they rhyme like cucumber sandwiches and tea made by Emily, by Emily. or something. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it made me like stuff like that made me laugh. So I appreciate the, the tongue in cheek sense of humor, which is very much like the Who, right? And uh, kind of like the the naughty little you know humor yep. used. Right? I know Sid, this, where Sid Barrett lives kind of is in that vein too. That this song. with the bird sounds in yeah. there to sort of simulate the insanity, right? Like yep. that's how I I read that one at least. Uh, my that was my tea. I don't know how you guys heard that, but that's how I felt like it was sort of like it yeah, was definitely, of its place. they were definitely being cheeky for sure. Yeah. Cheeky, yes, that's the term. <laughs> and I think what did Sam say? Or having a laugh, Sam yeah. said earlier too. We got very British in this one, I think, because of the the tone of what was going on. But um but yeah, I, I it's not so much I dislike this album. I think it was just it um it didn't feel essential to me in the way that 
um, some of the albums felt it felt more sort of continuing on a theme. Mm. And um, I was surprised by how much the production bothered me because Josh, much like you, I real I recognized it immediately as a choice and yeah. not like, oh, this is poorly produced, right? Like it's it's not like the first two Kiss albums, right? Where it's like, who the hell produced this shit? They tried yeah. for something like I'm thinking of that as a famous example, right? Or like that one Bowie album, right? Early that kind of swore him to say, okay, I'm always gonna have great production from now on. But um, but yeah, it, it I, I, to me, Garage Rock is is best when it sort of feels like it pops off the. I guess the album would, or the the record, right, would be what you'd mm-hmm. say, because that's when you're listening on the record player, right? And this one, I think the production didn't make it pop. And but yeah, can you see Brit pop, um, the Arctic Monkeys, right? Like there's songs here that you can absolutely see Alex Turner, you know, lyrically writing. He has yep. that same sort of like distinctly British accent, exactly. And, yeah, um, yeah, stuff like that. So um, yeah, and a, a lot of like. Uh, mid 2000s and even early 2010s alt rock bands like would it would not be hard to sort of place it together um you know within sort of this general feel and and the psychedelic vibe we've we've underplayed that i think a lot too there's there's some songs that that very much veer into that realm there's no uh, electric jug on this album <laughs> but definitely no. there's identifiable uh psychedelic uh tinges yeah, there. Yeah, mm-hmm. tinges is a good point. I was gonna bring that up because I didn't really get too. It didn't really get too psychedelic to me. I was. You kept reading that in the uh, description. I guess maybe well, the some glittering of the later prizes. Albums. The glittering prizes has psychedelic tinges for yeah. sure. I felt like at least. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah. If you go back and listen to it, so. Um, yeah, psychedelic. Yeah. I mean, that that go listen to our first season where we talk about psychedelic, but. Um, it's it's always been kind of nebulous to me, and and one of the as one of the descriptors. It's it's like that old like pornography quote, right? Like I know it when I, you know you know yeah. when you see it. Like I know psychedelic when I hear it, right? Yeah. And like there are pieces of it. So yeah. So you just I, you I, just weren't nostalgic for our first season, like I was, I guess. I guess yeah, maybe you were just yeah, you were in the uh, you're digging deep, right? Because yeah. if there's one thing I think of when I think of you, Josh, it's being <laughs> right, a sentimental nostalgic. guy. So yeah, <laughs> living in nostalgia. Yeah. So it sounds like thumbs up for you. It sounds like uh, at least a slight thumbs up for Sam. Am I reading you correctly? Yeah. No, th- this mm-hmm. was this was a, a fun album. Yeah. Not one that's going to like stand out in the pantheon of the 80s stuff. Hence why it, pro- it made this list rather than the actual like list that you go through but it was solid and yeah i'm gonna give this one a slight thumbs down for me it did it, it didn't hit me as much i think it so you liked halloween down. yanni more than than this <laughs> it spoke to me more man it just it just it appealed to me more yeah this this one um this one didn't rise to i think it was it would have been in the middle of the road but the production did not speak to me uh as much but um but i can recognize why it would be influential in its own way although mm. that description we read at the beginning i'm like i might have to listen to more of them to see how they led to like mgmt and yeah it um, seems like maybe groups, from album like, to album they change or something based on that they yeah they have they, like i said uh even jesus and mary chain sounds um like a real stretch having yep. covered multiple albums by them i i mean i i guess josh it could be that you know the slight down tune of the guitars at times but um i felt like jesus and mary chain were laboring in a very different sonic space um outside of maybe the shared 50s and 60s you know yeah. influence i guess would be the the one thing but um anyway An- another band <laughs> just in one last note another band that popped into mind that's like them sort of is xtc very much like the british mm. kind of like not in terms of like sound necessarily because so, yeah. xtc is more produced and, and but the, sto- what the the storytelling yeah yes. that the, yeah the, the quintessentially the british storytelling yep. yes absolutely so i yeah that's a, that's another good uh, touch point and they would have been released i think the first xtc album that we did not um skylarking but um uh gosh i am english settlement liking. english settlement yep there you yeah. go would it would be around this time that this album yeah. would have been coming out so um yeah 
So uh, 